In this lecture, I'm going to cover the general negative arguments on the topic. Now, these I would divide into topicality, disadvantages, counterplans, and critiques. And on the case area topic, I suggested a couple of cases that I thought were strong and other potential case areas that could develop. While I don't mean this to be an exhaustive list of all the generic arguments on the negative, I think that it is going to, the arguments that I'm discussing are going to become kind of the most common generic arguments based on the way other topics have played out. Now, first of all, in terms of topicality, there are a lot of negative, potential negative topicality arguments. Um, I did discuss some of those in the introductory lecture that was mostly about the words and what they mean. Um, I do think obviously like substantially reduced are going to become important, but I don't want to go into those here as I already covered that um, in the lecture, in the beginning introductory lecture. So please make sure you have listened to that. But I'm also going to discuss disadvantages, counter plans, and critiques. Now let's start with disadvantages. Uh, politics disadvantages have obviously become a lot more complicated because Trump, it's difficult to figure out what agenda item Trump is pushing that he needs a particular party for, and he randomly changes his mind on whether or not he supports agenda items. So he had, you know, the other day he had a meeting uh, with the Democrats to try to see, start some talks on a potential infrastructure bill. And he got really angry at them for kind of accusing him of, you know, doing, engaging in illegal activities. So he just broke off the infrastructure talks. So I think kind of having a, a politics disadvantage is a, a little bit difficult in terms of an agenda item. There will be a couple other arguments that will get, get debated. The first is the election. Um, how much of these arms sales will impact election outcomes? Probably a little difficult to argue, but it's certainly there. And then, of course, there is the base, the conservative base. Will the conservative base be alienated um, by a reduction in arms sales? That's certainly possible. If Trump loses the support of his conservative base, then the argument is that he might be more aggressive militarily. So that's something that I think you really need to, um, uh, you know, consider what your politics disadvantage will look like. You know, if obviously if it has Congress block a sale that um, Trump wants, if that's the plan, then that's going to hurt relations, at least between the president and the Congress. But at the same time, remember that the executive doesn't even have to submit uh, sales for approval. They can just decide um, not to kind of like uh, certify the sale. It's not like Congress is going to force him uh, to sell weapons and like Trump's going to block it. It, it kind of gets a little strange. So the kind of probably the way normal means most policies would happen would be for the for the executive branch of the government not to support the sale in the first place. If they don't support the sale, then Congress isn't going to get involved. So um, I think there, you know, we're always going to have politics arguments. They're very popular uh, in policy debate. Coaches like to work on them. We have a lot of coaches now like doing research. So they're going to come up from that reasons. They're very timely. You can always try to catch a team off guard with the newest piece of evidence. They can be net benefits to things like counter plans. Um, they can be very, very um, important that way. So I think that's something that you need to, you know, we're definitely be debating politics disadvantages, even if the, the link process maybe isn't as strong and they're going to become net benefits to process counter plans. But that's really one to think about it. Like with anything, think about which constituency would be alienated, which political constituency would be alienated by not continuing the sale. In this case, you're probably looking at Republicans or more conservative interests. How might they react to Trump if Trump doesn't support these sales? Um, how might they react to Trump if Trump is actually kind of goes in opposition to the sales? So how might they react? What would that might be for what might that mean for legislative agenda items? What might it mean for a Trump lash out in terms of whether or not he's getting the support of of his own party? If he's alienating Democrats, what does that mean for the agenda? Or if the Democrats like this policy, maybe that'll help him with his agenda. So that's always what you want to think out. Again, there's separate lectures on politics to listen to. But those are considerations. So the second thing is Russia, China. Um, these, I think, there's a couple links. The basic argument is it's kind of really a strong defense of the status quo. It says that when we sell weapons to our allies, this enhances our deterrence posture against, like Russia in certain regions, and against China and other regions. Right? It helps us gain allies. It increases their support for us, and most importantly, it helps us make our weapon systems interop interoperable. As I discussed in the introductory lecture, you can't, you know, you can't just kind of have two weapon systems work together when they're not running the same software. And the pilots and the people who operate the tanks, like, haven't been the, trained in the same way, and they don't have coordinated systems. So these, selling these weapons strengthens our allies against our adversaries, 
like definitely against Russia and potentially our military, uh, an emerging military competitor, China. And the second, the second advantage they have is that um, if the U.S. sells, right, then the countries arguably don't go buy the weapons from, you know, China and or Russia, which strengthens their own in defense industrial bases, strengthens indirectly, strengthens their own military capabilities. So there's already a Russia disadvantage available at the website. And I think that that is kind of important and can be use and useful to do. The third category of disadvantage is what we could call allied prolif. Prolif simply re means the spread of something. In this context, proliferation refers to the spread of nuclear weapons. All right. The idea is, is that, look, if Japan feels insecure, they'll develop nuclear weapons. If Saudi Arabia loses kind of its ability to defend itself with conventional weapons, then they'll develop nuclear weapons. Same with South Korea, Taiwan, potentially Germany. You're looking at countries that all have the capability, all right, to develop nuclear weapons if they want to. You should have also put Israel on this list. Some people say Israel already has nuclear weapons. They just haven't disclosed them. But it would be bad if the India, I mean, Israel came out and told the world they had nuclear weapons because if they disclosed their nuclear weapons, because people would see that as threatening. So regardless, you can see kind of a development of nuclear weapons, announcement of nuclear weapons, investment in, in nuclear postures and kind of the spread of nuclear weapons, you can argue, um, would increase the spread of war and conflict. And we can talk about that, why that's true for some other reasons. Um, you could also just kind of talk generally about why our allies are good, um, that we want to have strong relations with NATO, Japan, with South Korea, with India. Um, it just kind of increases deterrence generally, dampens conflicts. Um, it's good to have allies. Like there's a bunch of literature written on this, um, why we should have them and why they're important and why the U.S. needs to maintain a Western alliance system. So that could kind of go with allied prolif a little bit, or it could go into a separate category um, of disadvantages themselves. Certainly, you could maybe move, you could make one larger argument out of Russia and China and use that as your impact to kind of our allies' good arguments. You could tweak these arguments in different ways, develop them in different ways. You could separate them. Some are related to another, um, but there you go. The next category of disadvantages is what we call impact terms. Sometimes it's hard to kind of quantify what the link to a disadvantage is, so people just read impact terms. In this case, you know, there's a couple you could say, look, instability in the Gulf region is good because political instability makes oil prices high, right? When buyers of oil, right, if we're not sure if you can get access to a product, the price of that product increases because people say, oh, it's going to be more difficult to get, so people can start charging more for it. It's a simple law of supply and demand. Well, if there's instability in the Gulf and oil prices are increasing, that might encourage the world to transition to renewable energy, which could solve climate change. This has been argued on many other topics. It'll probably be argued on future topics. The second thing is you could say maybe instability is good. Maybe it's good if there's instability because it causes higher arms sales for Russia. And Russia and, and arms sales are important to Russia's economy. And without a stronger economy, it'll collapse and that'll cause war. Um, that'll increase tariffs because they're not going to be able to secure their nuclear facilities. This has been argued on other topics to say, look, it's actually good. Now, you have to kind of, when arguing that type of disadvantage, argue that, that you know, the Russian sales, that won't escalate to a big world war. It's actually the decline that does. Those will be fleshed out more on those um, and those debates, but that's kind of what you want to say in terms of that. You could also argue the defense industrial base. So a lot of the justification for the weapon sales is twofold. One, we make money when we sell this. This increases jobs. But two, it's like there's kind of this basic economy of scale argument. Right? If the U.S. needs 100 F-35 fighters and those cost, you know, just, just make it easy, a million dollar a piece. They're a lot more than that. Okay, then it costs, you know, we need 100 of them. Maybe it costs $100 million. But if we can actually sell 1,000 of these or make 1,000 of these and sell them all around the world to all our allies then maybe the cost for us goes down to like $500,000 a piece. It's not that simple. Those are really low price estimates I just gave you. But the idea is that this is going to strengthen our overall defense industrial base. Now, it is a little difficult to argue like how much is really going to make a difference. I mean, to give you some context, the U.S. defense budget is now approximately $800 billion a year. Now, that's not all for acquisitions of new technology, but a substantial amount of it is, Right? So we're spending hundreds of billions of dollars a year on our own defense industry. Even if we cut back a, miss, a, a missile defense system that's maybe we're selling for like $10 million, which is probably on the high end, right? What, what, that's like a drop in the bucket, right? Just compared to our own defense spending, let alone all other arms sales. How 
that really going to defense our uh, affect our defense industrial base? Well, one of the things that Dave said in his in his topic podcast was that like, oh, you might say something like, yeah, the, the defense industry is generally okay. They're deciding whether or not they have money to invest in like fusion and like outer space exploration, right? And they have to make a determination as to whether or not they're going to do that. And if they if they have enough money, they have a little bit more revenue. Maybe they'll make those investments, and those things will be good. It's still a little eh. Like, why is that really going to make that much of a difference? Obviously, defense industries, they don't just use their own cash to make investments, right? They have investors, they're borrowing money. They're not just kind of completely dependent on getting the cash from a sale to Saudi Arabia, like a small business may be, right? But you kind of get that idea where this could go with the defense industrial base. You can also argue leverage. Leverage is good, all right? That it's very important that... Um, the U.S. like kind of maintain the sales because then we can always like threaten other countries to get by to say, hey, we're, you know, we're selling you these weapons, but if you don't do what you want, what we want, we'll take them away. I'm not arguing for that as a plan. I'm just saying that's kind of that's not topical, right? That's kind of the reality of a of a sale. It also may give them influence on how they we, they use the weapons. We'd say, hey, you know, if you use the weapons to go blow up the school, we're not going to give you any more, right? It creates some influence. Um, which kind of goes with other things, just kind of generally, like I talked about Russia and China in terms of Russia and China's ability, like their ability to fill in and sell weapons to other countries, right? Like, well, if they're going to sell these weapons to other countries, um, then they're going to, they're going to get the benefit of the sale. So beyond the, uh, beyond Russia and China, you could be looking at the UK, France, and Germany. And one big thing with the UK, France, and Germany, their weapons are largely interoperable with US weapons, right? Because we built these together. These are our allies. Um, so as long as we're building kind of these weapons together and that these are our allies and these weapons are interoperable, if they fill in, if they decide and they say, well, we're going to sell weapons to Saudi Arabia, they're probably going to work with US weapons. So Saudi Arabia wouldn't have to replace all its weapons. Whereas if the US cuts off weapons to Saudi Arabia, and so does Europe, then they can't really... It's harder for them to get them from Russia and China. They could eventually, but a lot of evidence says it would take a decade to replace them. You could say, look, it would generally hurt relations, like with India, if we stopped selling them weapons with South Korea, Japan. Then you could flip back there. That could go with your general allies' good arguments. Though so Those arguments are more kind of written from a military perspective, but just about relations. Relations can be solving other problems in the area, environmental problems. It could be helpful to resolving trade disputes. Um... Those things kind of all, you could kind of impact the other argument there. So you can see, you know, you could kind of, like I say, make a grander, a larger argument about all those things, or you could keep them a bit separated. Um, you could also, some people say PMC shift, what's a PMC? A PMC is a private military corporation. The argument is, is that if they can't get access to U.S. weapons, then what they'll do is that they're going to rely on more um, private military contractors, maybe even from other countries, and that those... Are more deadly. You can you could impact China. I put China colonialism separately. I could have put it back with the other uh, China argument. But in addition to maybe some of the harms of if China steps in as an alternative supplier, not just an alternative supplier, right? Which is why I had that over there. But if the U.S. loses influence in the Middle East and China comes in and China becomes more influential in the Middle East, maybe they'll start acting like a colonial power and maybe they'll be worse. Um, there's a lot of arguments you could discuss there. So those are all some potential disadvantages, you have your politics disadvantages, you have your alternative suppliers filling in, maybe those are being worse, you have reduced relations and military cooperation with our allies, you have the potential loss of our defense industrial base, um, now maybe on the, the, the total flip side you have impact turns that you want to read, you can't all read all these disadvantages together, right, because some of these disadvantages essentially the argument is increased risk of war or conflict. But if you don't want to read those, you could say war or conflict, good. And then you have your politics arguments, right, about kind of the process of implementing it, which you could change if you have a process counter plan. Now, in terms of counter plans, there's a number, of, there are some different counter plans that you can run. Um, I think that the first one is like a conditions counter plan. So a conditions counter plan would say instead of reducing the arms sales, we should like freeze the arms sales, right? So this is another context in which the term reduce comes in, becomes important. Say, look, we're not gonna we're not gonna tell you like long term into the future whether or not like we're gonna sell you weapons. We're not gonna reduce them. We're not gonna give you any more right now, okay? Until you stop bombing in Yemen. And people do use that term freeze, 
okay, that we should freeze arms sales, Saudi Arabia. We're going to freeze the arms sales. If you stop bombing in Yemen, then we'll keep selling your arms again. Now they say, well, why is this better than reducing the sales? Because look, the freeze maintains leverage. If we just tell Saudi Arabia, we're not going to give you any more arms, we're going to reduce the sales, you're not going to get any more, Saudi Arabia is going to say, okay, fine, we'll have to take a break from the war maybe, but we're going to go get these weapons from Russia and China, and then we're going to resume the war, right? And we're going to, and we're going to start killing everyone in Yemen again, just like we were doing before. So the argument is, is that they, they're going to resume, like we, when we lose our influence, right? Remember that argument I just talked about? If we just reduce the sales, we lose our influence. They get them from all turn suppliers. They execute the war. If we freeze the sales, condition the sales on then doing something in particular to get the weapon back, okay, then that's actually that is what's going to be called the problem. And you'll see that that's actually what most of the literature proposes, right? So he's talking about one thing, you know, it's kind of hard to find a good affirmative, right? Well, one of the other thing reasons it's hard to find a good affirmative is I think it's difficult to answer the conditions counterplan. And because it's difficult to answer the conditions counterplan, it's really going to limit, practically limit, like the number of affirmative cases that are out there. So I think that's something that you want to do a lot of work on. It's something that I started doing work on, something I need to do more work on. There's some good evidence on this, but I think it's definitely one of the stronger negative arguments. I mean, in many cases, you could probably go into the affirmative quote-unquote affirmative solvency articles, the articles like the evidence they read to support their solvency, that really just kind of comes right out and says like, oh, yeah, we should actually like condition this. And you can read their own evidence like right back against them. Um, you could also say there's probably like more political support for condition, right? There's certainly more political support for people saying we're going to suspend arms sales to Saudi Arabia. We're going to suspend or freeze arms sales until they stop their bombings in Yemen. Then we'll give them back. That's actually what most of the legislation Congress is about. So you could say, look, there's a lot more political support for this type of freeze than there is for an actual reduction. And even if you read evidence that the affirmative will try to read that says their plan's popular, like Saudi Arabia or the, the U.S. Congress doesn't support the status quo, they're opposed to Saudi Arabia, they're tired of all these kids bomb, dying in the bombings. Yes, these people support a freeze on arms sales to Saudi Arabia, a freeze until Saudi Arabia stops bombing. They do not necessarily support a reduction. Sure, do some of those people also support a reduction? Of course. But most of them are supporting a freeze. So you're gonna, it's more politically acceptable to maintain a freeze than it is to support a reduction. So you see I'm already on net benefit number two. Net benefit, right? So we had net benefit number one. It actually makes them stop the behavior they're engaging in rather than just kind of giving up. Net benefit number two we have is our politics disadvantage. Number three which is really kind of embedded in number one a little bit is an alternative suppliers argument, right? So it's like, look, they're not going; they won't go to alternative suppliers because they're eventually going to be able to get their weapons back. Then you have number four, you know, U.S. and defense industrial base net benefit because they maintain our supplies over the long term. Same with alliances. You see how all these arguments kind of work as net benefits to this counterplan. So I think this is a very strong argument, and it's going to be tough for affirmatives to debate this, and it's something that. They need to think about like when they're designing their cases. Now let's talk about the second is a process counterplan. Now, look, as I mentioned at the beginning of the case section, there's a lot of different ways. Um, you, you could like it's kind of stop an arms sale. You could have the president not submit it. You could have the president not certify it. You could have the Congress not approve it. You could have the Congress pass legislation blocking arms sales to a particular country. You could kind of develop like a new national military strategy that has some certain processes for the way arms sales are implemented. So I think that you, um, and, the, and in these cases, these process counter plans are all going to become net benefits to um, the, the politics. I mean, politics will be the primary net benefit to these counter plans. And I think by the time camps are over, we'll have a full list of them. We'll have a lecture just on the process counter plan. Um, another counter plan is probably like a little bit of abuse of fiat. Can talk about that. Is that's just to reject arms sales, all right? To reject arms sales. So and just say instead of having the U.S. not sell weapons to Saudi Arabia, just say oh Saudi Arabia saves so up. We're not going to buy them anymore. It's probably a little unfair. It's probably an abuse of fiat, but I think people will try that. On old school foreign policy topics, the popular argument was always a consult counter plan. So you'd say, well, we'll consult another country. And the trick would be that you'd say, well, this country, 
Like, if we go to China and say, should we consult, not sell arms to Saudi Arabia? They'll be like, okay, sure. So they would agree, right? So you go to China and say, look, should we not sell arms to Saudi Arabia? We'll do whatever you say. If, Saudi Arabia, if China says yes, we'll stop the arms sales. If they say no, we'll continue them. The, the trick was that China would say yes, but they would just be happy we asked. That we engaged in this genuine consultation. We gave them a real opportunity to say yes or no. Okay, so the argument is, is that we, if we give them this real opportunity to say yes or no, that that's like would help um, relations with that country. If there are a lot of cases, it's probably good to have one of these process or consult counter plans or defend the theory on reject against a very kind of small arms sales case that you might debate that you're not all that prepared for. We also have critiques. A number of different critiques that I also think are strong on this topic. The one is called weaponitis, and it's something that Dave discussed in his podcast. The idea is that, look, it's not the weapons that, that are responsible for the conflict. That there are things in our society, the way the world functions, that creates the demand for these weapons. And what we really need to do is solve these underlying problems of like the human condition and the way we've organized our societies. Okay, if we're ever really going to reduce violence, just taking a few weapons here and there out of a place is not really going to reduce violence. People, like we know, can get the weapons from other places. They can kill people with their bare hands or like spears or bayonets, or they can starve people by denying them access to food, or they can put diseases on blankets the way, you know, the Europeans killed the Native Americans. It doesn't really matter whether or not the U.S. sells weapons, that it's kind of belong, right? Weaponitis. We say, oh, we're just like afraid of the weapons. It's the weapons that kill us. It's not really the weapons that kill us. It's the demands that we've created. So you could say like, and you can kind of combine this with other critiques. You can say, look, it's capitalism. Okay. Capitalism, that what we're trying to do is really make money because our society is capitalistic and make money. We're always trying to make money. Then we kind of invent ways to make money by like selling weapons and driving conflicts. Right. So that's one link to capitalism. Some other people say if we reduce our military presence, we'll also increase our economic presence more, which would be like economic imperialism. So that's kind of a different type of a link to the capitalism. Okay, not really the same as weaponitis. But I just mentioned it here because you can say like capitalism drives this underlying system. You can say imperialism drives it. The U.S. and Western countries and other countries. I mean, China was imperial Japan. Right. These great imperial powers are always trying to take over other parts of the world. And this is what drives military conflict in this region. You can say maybe it's gender violence, right? So you can look at maybe it's racism. So I mean, there's a lot of other factors. It's, there's underlying factors that are driving it and are driving the way the human condition is and like how people interact with each other, okay? And that that is what's really bad, right? And just kind of pretending that we're going to solve these problems by taking the weapons away is the wrong thing. We need our alternative needs to be to go at these human conditions. Now, now the second uh, critique is what's called positive peace. It's a little bit, it's kind of consistent with this weaponitis argument, right? Say, look, we shouldn't focus on taking away the weapons. We shouldn't focus on negotiating conflict agreements. What we need to focus on is human development, how people develop, like their health, their well-being, their, their human happiness. We need to focus on these things and contribute to a situation of positive peace. Um, you could also make a race argument, and you know, there's gonna be a lot of race arguments, right? These are common in debate, and they're gonna come up on the affirmative too, but I think that the basic negative argument at a really basic level is to say, look, the current system, the way we've organized the world, right, ever since imperialism has been kind of driven by a white a desire by whites to control the world. And by reducing arms sales, all you're doing is trying to kind of tinker with the system. To make it seem like a little bit better, which what you really need to do is kind of confront the overlying, the, or you say the under and overlying and underlying kind of racial attitudes that are kind of promote the current like global order. Um, there's arguments about like just kind of threat construction that can kind of cut both ways. If you know the affirmative outlines a bunch of threats, you can say like, hey, these are just kind of artificial threats. They're not real. They're not real threats. There's a critique of Mutimer, the quote unquote proliferation. Um, it's bad to use that metaphor. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of other critiques too, um, but they're probably going to sit along similar lines. I just wanted to mention some that were topic specific, uh, and then we're going to get 
debated a lot. Oh, I should say, you know, I've mentioned with the, the threat construction, your securitization argument, right? It's bad to have security solutions to conflict, which go with positive peace. Again, we'll probably end up doing a whole other lecture just on critiques. Um, as arguments develop more, there are just so many different critiques. And part of the ones you're going to end up debating is going to be a little bit determined by like what arguments the camps put out. Um, but that's a significant part of it. All right. Then we also have um, solvency arguments, right? Solvency arguments. So um, I kind of put these, I kind of talked about these a little bit differently. Um, and we see we have alternative suppliers, Russia, China, UK sales. Countries can produce their own weapons, all right? Maybe they already have enough weapons. Um, if you disarm one side, maybe that leads to aggression by another, right? So I can contextualize this in terms of the Saudi Arabia case. There's a lot of evidence that says, hey, if we, if we um, take away the weapons from the Saudis, the Houthis, who they're fighting in Yemen, they're just going to overrun Yemen and maybe even go into Saudi Arabia, Right? Just because two sides have been fighting, if two sides have been fighting, it doesn't make a lot of sense to disarm the other one. Also, if you take away countries' weapons, maybe they're going to come insecure. Maybe they're going to lash out, be more aggressive, say, okay, we're about to lose all our weapons. We're not going to be very secure anymore, so before somebody attacks us, let's attack them. In the context of Saudi Arabia, there's evidence that makes those arguments. And again, I talked about the U.S. influence and enabling arguments before. So, you know... <coughs> I think that these are all like strong negative arguments um, that are going to be difficult for the affirmative to beat. I think that's one thing when you think back of that, you know, first lecture, all the different potential cases, 98 countries, okay, 98 countries, all these different weapon systems, lots of different weapons like to sell, like how am I going to manage this topic? Well, you're going to manage this topic because on face, a lot of these cases right, aren't very good. They're not even really read solvency evidence that says that, if you take away this weapon, it's going to produce some great advantage. Second of all, you can debate whether or not they're an actual reduction, like relative to what. Okay. Third, you have a potential process counterplan. At the very least, you have a conditions counterplan that you can run. You have weapon weaponitis and other underlying conditions critiques, whether it's racism, colonialism, imperialism, right, gender inequality, all those things like kind of driving uh, driving the underlying issue, and then you can also critique their representations from the perspective of security or race or just their metaphors. There's a lot of strong negative arguments uh, that might even be better than the cases themselves. So I really wouldn't worry about the breadth of the topic too much at this point. As Dave suggests in his podcast, it is a good idea to kind of start broadly and start thinking about these issues, and maybe you'll find that little affirmative in the haystack at the library. Um, but don't be afraid. There's a lot of strong negative weapons for you to use.